Amen. Thank you, John, David, and Charlotte, and Lisa, and Art, and Crystal. How many love our praise worship team? Amen. I was reading in Psalms this morning in my devotion, Psalms 122, I think it was. It says, I was glad when they said unto me, let us come into the house of the Lord. Are you glad this morning? I love God's presence. We miss Pastor Robert and Jackie. We know that they've had a good week out in Colorado with their uh, daughter and son-in-law. Their daughter's pregnant. And so uh, if they're watching, hello, Pastor Robert and Jackie. Bless you. (laughs) Say a prayer. (laughs) I do appreciate the opportunity that uh, Pastor Robert's given me to speak to you guys. Uh, Bonnie and I love Bethany. You, you, you are just an answer to prayer. You guys are an answer to prayer. We, we love and respect all of you guys. There's just a caliber, there's a depth here that's unique, and we need to cherish that. Praise God. Well, when thinking about a topic to preach on this morning, uh, I wanted to speak about something that Pastor Robert has been speaking about. I wanted to reinforce that. Kind of like in football, when somebody goes to tackle, you want your teammates to come along and pile on. So I intend to pile on today into uh, some things that uh, Pastor Robert's been teaching us. So I looked through my notes of sermons over the past few months, and the following recurring themes jumped out at me. I figured I could maybe build upon one of these topics. He talks a lot about blessed assurance, so maybe I could reinforce with a message about assurance of salvation. Maybe we need a hot fire and brimstone message to scare the pudding out of us. Or I could talk about the good days or the good nights Irene has. Or kicking the pants. Or maybe even something freaky weird. (laughs) so I'm just poking fun at you Pastor Robert how many appreciate his humor and colorful way that he delivers the truth to us yeah anyway upon further reflection I rejected all of those in favor favor of a phrase that we've heard Pastor Robert say to us over and over again and that is you were made for more than waiting to die and go to heaven. Would you say that with me? You were made for more than waiting to die and go to heaven. Let's put it in the first person. I am made for more. I am made for more than waiting to die and go to heaven. I really like that one. How about you? I get excited about that subject. Talking about being made for more cranks my crank and floats my boat. To quote a really good preacher I know, it rings my bell, it bakes my cake, and it butters my biscuit. This dog will hunt. You see, Pastor Robert, I got a few catchy phrases myself. But you, sir, are the master of them. On the flip side, it burns my grits to see how many of us Christians have drunk the enemy's lullaby juice and are asleep on the job waiting passively to die and go to heaven with an insurance policy in hand. I hope that burns your grits too. As we begin this morning, could I ask you to stand one more time with me and join with me in reading out loud these three passages from God's Word. And if you don't mind, when confessing these scriptures, would you give some extra stress to the words I have marked in bold? Let's now read it together. Pray then in this way. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is among men. And he will dwell among them, and they shall be his people. And God himself 
will be among them. Let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, give us grace this morning to see with new eyes what you're doing in heaven and on earth. Give us a renewed vision of the Lord Jesus Christ, your exalted and beloved Son, and your plans for him in creation, how we fit into those plans. Let the anointing and the power of the Holy Spirit be upon the words spoken in truth, and any words not from you, Lord, let them fall to the ground. We ask for you to move our hearts this morning so that we can serve you better. Please glorify Jesus and strengthen the church. In Jesus' name we pray. Everybody said, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. So what were we made for? What is our destiny? Is it mainly about us dying and going to heaven? Or is it perhaps something else? To answer these questions, we're going to need to step back and look at the big picture storyline of the Bible. And especially what the Bible says about eschatology. What's eschatology? That's just a fancy word. It means the study of last things. Eschatology tells us about our future, our destiny, tells us how the story ends. It tells us where God is providentially guiding and directing world history. You know, Scripture reveals way too much for us to stay in the dark about eschatology because how the story ends is really important. How many know that? Because how we view the end shapes how we see the world around us and how we see our role in it and how we act here and now. So just so we're on the same page, when I talk about eschatology, I'm not talking about setting any dates for when Christ turns, and I'm not interested in arguing over end-time chronology charts. That's not the purpose at all. What should be our goal in learning eschatology? The goal should be to discover God's in-state vision so that we can align with it and come into agreement with it. I want to know where God is headed. How about you? And one thing that we'll quickly discover when we get into studying the last things, eschatology revolves around Jesus. He's the center of the story. He's the protagonist. He's the main character in the drama. He's the hero. I like what Dr. Kevin DeYoung said. He's a theologian and a pastor of a church actually close to us in Matthews, North Carolina. I quote him, no matter what you think about Jesus, we can be certain that you and I think too little of him. Dear Father, enlarge our vision of Jesus. Help us see him as you see him. I want you to think with me for a minute this morning, how do we get to the place we find ourselves in today where dying and going to heaven has become the main thing? How did that idea become so ingrained in our thinking and the dominant storyline we embrace? I'd like us to listen to a song that I think captures the essence, the popular view about going to heaven when we die. I think you'll recognize the song. How many have sung that song? Yeah, I have too. It's got a very catchy tune, doesn't it? Like so many songs we sing, it has a strong emotional hold on us. Somebody said that most churchgoers get their theology more from the songs they sing than the Bibles they read. I think it was A.W. Tozer who said, Christians don't tell lies, they just go to church and sing them. Lies, Lies might be a bit strong there, maybe not. But I think we can all agree that some of the songs we sing may make us feel good, but at the expense of biblical truth. Would you agree with that? So let's analyze the lyrics of the song, shall we? Verse 1 describes a flying away from this world at death to our home on God's celestial shore. Verse 2 compares our flight at death to a bird released from prison, finally free to soar up to heaven. 
Verse 3 describes our life here as having cold iron shackles on our feet, but at death, those shackles holding us down, they get unlocked. Again, another imprisonment and release metaphor. Verse 4 speaks of just a few more weary days, and then I'll fly away to another land where joys will never end. I'll fly away. The song fits nicely with the narrative most of us have heard all our lives at church, funeral services, even in popular media. It reinforces the idea that going to heaven when we die is the goal, the finish line, the conclusion to the story, the main point of the good news of Jesus Christ. I put together a little diagram. I like to draw diagrams if y'all hadn't figured this out by now. <laughs> so this, is, this message is mainly a slideshow with me commenting on it, okay? Just so you know. <laughs> yes, sir. <right. laughs> so here's a diagram. The story most of us have learned. Let's look at it. The story is essentially essentially a two-chapter gospel story, a story of fall and redemption, followed by a flight to heaven when we die, the eternal home of the saved. Chapter 1, the fall tells us we're fallen, sinful creatures separated from God. Chapter 2, redemption proclaims there's redemption for us in Christ Jesus, who died on the cross to save us from our sins so we can go to heaven instead of hell when we die. It's a salvation story of escape, of going up to an otherworldly place called heaven to be with God, Jesus, and the angels. When we die or get raptured, then we get our wings. We leave this evil world behind, fly away to our eternal home in the heaven. The poor earth and all, all, all its nations, on the other hand, they don't fare so well. After enduring the apocalyptic judgments mentioned in the book of Revelation, the earth goes boom destroyed, annihilated in some great big ball of fire. This story, or some close variation of it, is ingrained in the popular imagination and within our Christian subculture. As the song said, our corruptible mortal bodies are like a prison we need to escape from. What's important are souls, not bodies. Our true identity is somewhere over the rainbow in a heavenly world, ethereal, timeless, changeless. Earth and physical materiality in general and time and change are inferior. Good riddance, human bodies. Liberated spirits are what matters. Good riddance, earth. Heaven is what matters. Good riddance, clocks and time. Timelessness and eternity is what matters. Unfortunately, many aspects of the story I've just described share more in common with Platonism and Gnosticism than with biblical Christianity. The roots of such ideas can be traced back to ancient, radical, dualistic Greek philosophy instead of the teaching of the Bible. I'll have more to say about this flyaway story in a minute, but for now, I'd like for us to listen to another song we probably all have heard, but we don't sing it very much. It's a hymn published in 1901 with a bit of a different perspective. Please, please pay close attention to the lyrics displayed in this video. I love the lyrics in that song. I hope they resonate with you. Him paints a different picture than I'll fly away. It declares this is my father's world, celebrates the beauty and majesty of God's creation. Let's analyze the lyrics in this song. Verse 1, all creation has God's fingerprints on it. All nature sings, his music, his sun, his moon, his stars, his rocks, his trees, his skies and seas. In verse 2, the birds, the morning light, the lilies white declare their maker's praise. In rustling grass, we can hear him pass. He speaks to us everywhere. Verse 3, the hymn encourages not to forget that even though we see so much wrong and the wrong seems so strong, God is the ruler yet. We need to hear that. Some of you need to hear that this morning. Even though you see so much wrong in your world, God is the ruler yet. He wants you to know this morning that God is the ruler yet. Hold on to that, dear child of God. God is not finished with you. He will help you. The climax of this song comes in the last few, few lines of verse 3. This is my father's world. The battle is not done. Jesus who died shall be satisfied and earth and heaven will be one. Jesus being satisfied echoes Isaiah 53, 10 through 11. Listen to this. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. 
He shall see of the travail of his soul, and he shall be satisfied. Malt, Malt B. D. Babcock was the Presbyterian pastor from New York who wrote those lyrics, and he captured beautifully, I think, the in-state vision, that eschatology of God's intent for humanity in the world. Jesus, listen now, Jesus will be satisfied when the battle is done and he's put all enemies under his feet. Jesus will be satisfied when all things in heaven and earth, visible and invisible, are united in his headship. Jesus will be satisfied when he raises from the grave everyone whom the Father has given him, and he will not lose a single one. Jesus will be satisfied when he fills the earth with knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the water covers the sea. Jesus will be satisfied when the meek inherit the earth. Jesus will be satisfied when he sees the marriage of heaven and earth. The marriage of heaven and earth. It's my conviction that the flyaway story is fundamentally flawed. It's got a good tune, fundamentally flawed though, and needs to be revised. It's not all bad. Just There's some revisions we need to make to it. If we want to align ourselves with God's in-state vision and come into agreement. What kind of revisions? I believe we need to make at least five adjustments to the story. These are the main points of my message. They're listed on your handout. As we go along, we'll fill in the blanks for each one. Got it? Good. In the service, you get all five correct. You'll get an A. You miss one. You still get a passing grade. You miss two or more. You fail the test, and we'll have to assign you some church uh, grunt work, like maybe lining up the chairs before Sunday morning. (laughs) And they have to pass inspection from Pastor Robert. And trust me, that's harder than you think. (laughs) Just kidding. There's cruel, (laughs) cruel and unusual punishment. Sam said, "That's right." Just kidding, there's not, not going to be any grading of the handouts, but the chairs do have to be in a line. Well, I'm, I'm not kidding about that. <laughs> Let's look at adjustment number one. The first adjustment we need to make is to expand the story. I'll spend the most time this morning on this one, and then we'll move much quicker through the other four ones. So when it gets near 12 o'clock, you say, my goodness, he's only on point number one C. Don't worry. We'll move a lot faster towards the end. What do I mean by expand the story? Is a story of fall and redemption incorrect? Heavens no. Say heavens no. Heavens no. We believe and teach both fall and redemption. Romans 3.23 mentions both. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. There's the fall. Being justified as a gift by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. There's the redemption. Telling the story of fallen redemption, it's biblical, it's evangelical. We must declare it. We preach repentance from sin and dead works. We preach Christ and Him crucified. We proclaim forgiveness of sins in Jesus' name. We sing, what can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. We believe in the solas of the Protestant Reformation. If you're at the Wednesday night Bible study, you guys know what the solas are, right? Sola gratia, by grace alone. Sola fide, by faith alone. Solus Christus, in Christ alone. And soli deo gloria, to God alone be the glory. We believe these things. So what's the problem with a two-chapter gospel story? The problem is there's more to tell than what we typically tell. We've got to expand the story. The rescue's wonderful, but the reason is bigger than the rescue. The story is not just about our souls going to heaven when we die. That's not the end goal. I repeat, that's not the end goal. It's not the end of the story as told in the Bible. And we need to start adjusting the way we talk about it like it is the end all goal. The biblical drama It's much bigger than that. God has grand and majestic plans in his heart. They revolve around Christ, the coming of his kingdom on earth in great power and glory. Think about it. Jesus' career, it was cut short. 
by the sacrifice that he paid. There's so much more that he has to do on earth to fulfill all the biblical prophecies, to administer the kingdom granted to him by his Father in heaven. He's coming back to finish subjecting all things to his rule. Our destiny is wrapped up in his destiny. That destiny is cosmic, not just individualistic. We need a bigger frame for the picture, okay? We're cropping it too small. You guys do your digital photos, you know, you crop pictures. This story, this gospel story, is too big. We need, it's too small. We need to enlarge the frame for it. All right. Some of you may not be conv- convinced we need to tinker with this story. I get that. We've heard it all our lives. So let's talk some more about it. To underscore the problem we've gotten ourselves into, I'd like to point out four weaknesses of proclaiming only a two-chapter salvation story. The first weakness is it mistakes the part for the whole. The reason is bigger than the rescue. The rescue is glorious, but we want to proclaim, as Paul said to the Ephesian elders, the whole counsel of God. Remember that? We don't want to communicate only a portion. A second weakness is it leads to a very egocentric eschatology where salvation becomes all about me and my soul. Our culture is full of narcissism. How many know what a narcissist is? You've heard that term, right? A narcissist is somebody, it's a psychological disorder. It's where someone is obsessed with who? Themselves. They're obsessed with themselves. I mean, we use our phone cameras all the time to take what? Selfies. <laughs> self, 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 self. I coined a new uh, phrase a while back when I took a picture of Bonnie and I. I called it a doubly. <laughs> anyway, that, that's free. That wasn't even in the notes. So we are. We're preoccupied with ourselves, And unfortunately, that kind of slips into the way we read our Bibles. It slips into, into our church. We become spiritual narcissists and we make the story too much about us and not enough about Him. Jesus is the center of the story. We exist for Him and not the other way around. Anybody say amen? amen. I'm asking us this morning, abandon our egocentric eschatology where it's all about us and our souls going to heaven. And replace that with an emphasis, a Christocentric hope for the future, where it's more about the prophetic destiny of Jesus, Yeshua, and his coming kingdom of glory among the nations. His rising tide will then float all our boats. Brothers and sisters, we need to learn our true identity and our destiny. We're not merely sinners saved by grace, going to heaven when we die. Don't misquote me. I said we're not merely sinners. We are sinners saved by grace. All of us, horrible sinners. I've done some terrible things in my life that I'm really ashamed of. How about you? But we don't stop there. Our identity is not as sinners. We are now a new creation in Christ. Amen? By grace, we're now washed, we're now cleansed, we're now regenerated and renewed by the Holy Spirit. God now refers to us as saints, His holy ones, not as sinners. He calls us servants of the Most High God. He calls us brothers, His friends, His body, His bride. We're now empowered and anointed by the Holy Spirit to fulfill our priestly and our kingly destiny in Christ. Do you not know that we the saints will help Christ govern and administer the world in the age to come. We need a story that affirms our glorious destiny in Him. A fourth weakness in the flyaway gospel story is that it leads to an escapist view of redemption. In other words, getting saved gets reduced to a bus ticket out of here. Beam me up, Scotty. All you Star Trek fans. Listen to what I'm about to say. We need to escape escapism. That's right. How do you escape escapism? 
you replace it with inheritance theology. This is my father's world, not the devil's. Would you confess that with me, please? This is my father's world, not the devil's. My goal is not to go to heaven when I die. It's not. My goal is to be one of the meek ones who inherit the earth with Christ. Jesus Christ is God's Joshua. Listen to this now. Joshua, Jesus. The name Jesus is actually Joshua. Did you know that? In Hebrew, Joshua is Yeshua. Jesus is Yeshua. Joshua, Jesus. What did Joshua do in the Old Testament? Think about it. Jesus is God's Joshua. He'll lead the armies of heaven to this earth, our promised land. He'll drive out the wicked spiritual giants and their proxies. He'll give the land to his people. The kingdoms of this world will become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ. And he will give give the kingdom to the saints of the Most High God and not the wicked. The devil and his followers are now illegal usurpers of the property and they will be evicted. Out of here. I like to quote Abraham Kuyper. I don't know if you've ever heard of Abraham Kuyper. He was an influential prime minister of the Netherlands from 1901 to 1905. He's also a respected theologian. And Kuyper said, and I quote, There is not a square inch in the whole domain of our human existence over which Christ, who is sovereign over all, does not cry, Mine! I like that. I really think we need to preach more about the removal of the wicked from the earth rather than the removal of the righteous. Jesus said the same thing in Matthew 13, 41. Son of man will send forth his angels. They will gather out of his kingdom all stumbling blocks and those who commit lawlessness. And in verse 49, so it will be at the end of the age, the angels will come forth and take out the wicked from among the righteous. You got that? He's coming to take out the wicked from among the righteous. The end result will be the removal of the wicked. Verse 43, then the righteous, then the righteous will shine forth as a sun in the kingdom of their father. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. So let's talk some more about how we expand the story. I'd like to give us three ways we can expand it. First of all, we need to add the creation bookends, making it a four-chapter gospel story instead of just a two-chapter. The four chapters are creation, fall, redemption, and what? New creation. Four chapters. Add the creation bookends. Think about the Bible itself. It's structured that way. We have Genesis at the front end, describing how God in the beginning created the heavens and the earth. Revelation at the back end, showing us a vision of what? A new creation, a new heaven, a new earth. Look what it says in Revelation 21.5. He who sits on the throne said, Behold, I'm making all things new. Notice he didn't say, I'm making all new things. There's a difference. You see that? God's not going to make all new things. He's going to make all things new. That's renewal. That's restoration. The Bible begins with creation, ends with recreation. Do you see that? To expand the story, we've got to develop a biblical creation theology so that we can see creation the way God sees it. How does he see it? What is a biblical creation theology? First of all, it's a theology that understands seed and harvest and how those two are related. How many have heard that Genesis is the seed plot of the Bible? Yep. It even begins in a garden. In Revelation, what's it? It's the harvest book of the Bible. Have you ever read in Revelation where where the angel comes out and says, put in the sickle and reap? That's right. The harvest now is full grown. Remember, Jesus told a parable about the tares and the wheat. What did he say do in that parable? Let them both, let them both grow together. Don't try to weed them out yet. It's not time for the, the harvest yet. Let them both grow to full maturity. Then comes the harvest. Listen, brothers and sisters, we need to get our eyes 
off of the tares in their maturity and get our eyes on the wheat in its maturity. See, both are maturing, the tares and the wheat. Every day on the news, social media, we see the tares, the seed of the serpent, ripening in evil and lawlessness and mockery of God's commands. But we also see the wheat, the seed of the woman, Messiah's disciples, ripening in all purity, righteousness, devotion to Jesus. Jesus is, is preparing the harvest of wheat such that the last day church will be mature, spotless, and will boldly proclaim the gospel of the kingdom in the face of intense persecution and even death. Listen, brothers and sisters, God is getting us ready for this time that's coming. And it's going to take maturity. And God's doing that among us, isn't he? He's maturing us. He's maturing us. Creation theology also understands that creation is not bad. It's not, it's not evil. It's inherently good. What did God say after he made creation? He said it multiple times. It is good. And then, and then the sixth day he said it is very good. Right? God called creation good. Sin did come in and marred it. But God is very invested in creation. Sin is not going to spoil his plan for creation. Say that with me. God is very invested in creation. God is very invested in creation. In fact, he's so invested in it that he plans to fully inhabit earth himself after he purges it from evil, removes the curse, and restores it. Let me put it to you another way. God likes the neighborhood. And after he cleans it up, he plans to move in with us. All right? You ever thought of it that way? God created matter, not just spirit. Matter matters to God. Would you say that with me? Matter matters to God. Material creation is not a prison to escape from. It needs purging. It needs release from the curse. But this is my Father's world. The Bible says that the mountains and the hills will break forth into shouts of joy. All the trees of the field will clap their hands. If we don't praise Him, the rocks will. Lastly, a creation theology knows God is both the author and the finisher, the alpha and the omega. One thing that we can count on is what God starts in creation. He finishes in new creation. You believe that? When he starts in creation, he finishes in new creation. He doesn't quit. He doesn't give up. He doesn't let sin and the serpent spoil his plans. So we need both these creation bookends to properly frame the salvation story. Are you still with me? Next thing we do to expand the story is believe in the regeneration. Believe in the regeneration. You're probably wondering what I mean when I say we need to believe in the regeneration. Glad you asked that question. (laughs) The regeneration I'm speaking about here is not what happens when you become a Christian. That's one kind of regeneration. That's a spiritual, individual regeneration. What we're speaking about here is a regeneration of society and culture and government, a regeneration of the world system. Look at what Jesus said in Matthew 19, 28. Pay attention to this. It's on the screen. Jesus said, you who have followed me in the regeneration, when the Son of Man will sit on his glorious throne, you also shall sit upon 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. The word that Jesus used translated regeneration in the New American Standard and the New King James and Young's Little. It literally means Genesis again. It means Another Genesis, a rebirth, a recreation. Other translations, maybe yours, translate it as the new world, the renewal of all things, the recreation of the world. During the regeneration, Jesus said he would sit on the throne of his glory and his disciples would also sit on thrones, help it administer and and rule the rebirth world. The regeneration is the period of time when Jesus fully answers the prayer that we pray. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. 
After Messiah is finished with his work of restoration and making all things new upon the earth, he'll deliver the kingdom up to his father. His father will, will then join him by taking up his permanent residence among men in that perfected kingdom. At last, we will have the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb both residing with us, Emmanuel, God with us in a new creation. At this point, I just want to shout, Maranatha! Maranatha. Lord, come! come. That's what Maranatha means. Do it, Lord, soon. Peter had a vision of the regeneration. Acts 3.21, he says, Repent that he may send Jesus, whom heaven must receive until the period of restoration of all things. See that? You ever notice that? The period of restoration of all things. Of all things. Peter understood the concept of new creation because he knew the ancient prophecies well. And that included Habakkuk 2.14 that you confessed when we began this morning. That the whole earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Do you believe that? Do you really believe that? The whole earth will be filled with the glory of the Lord. The Lord's going to establish Jerusalem on Mount Zion. That's a mountain in Jerusalem. It's a capital city. It's going to become the teaching and media center of the world, disseminating Torah knowledge about God and His ways to the nation. CNN, ABC, NBC, Fox News, they're going to be replaced with Mount Zion News. Facebook will be replaced by Torah book. (laughs) Harvard, Stanford, and Oxford universities, they'll become remote campuses of Messianic University headquartered in Jerusalem. So to review, we expand the story by adding the creation bookends, believing in the regeneration, which includes the restoration of all things. The last thing that we need to do to expand the story, and this is very important, is to be sure and add the king and the coming kingdom. And let me explain what I mean by that. We know Jesus as the Lamb of God, but we also know him as who? The Lion of the tribe of Judah. Those are two opposite images, right? Lamb and Lion. He's the suffering servant, but he's also the holy Davidic warrior king. As Lamb of God, He brings us forgiveness and eternal life. And we tend to stop there because it solves our most important need. But by itself, that's a partial story. We can't stop there. When God raised Jesus from the dead, He declared Him to be both Lord and Christ. His redemptive work on the cross as Lamb of God has been finished. He he said on the cross, it is finished. That's the redemptive work. Nothing more to add to that. But His Work as Messiah and Davidic warrior king has not been finished. We must preach both Jesus and the gospel of the kingdom. Both Jesus and the gospel of the kingdom. He's a coming king. Coming here. Who is worthy to take the seven sealed scroll? The title deed to heaven and earth. The lion from the tribe of Judah, he has prevailed. He has overcome. He will take the book. He will reclaim full possession of his father's world. He will soon sit on the earthly throne of his father David in Jerusalem. This will come to pass exactly as prophesied by the angel to his mother Mary in Luke 1.32. Listen, Jesus did not die and rise again for a partial possession of only heaven, but that he might be Lord over all, inheritor of all things in heaven and on earth, 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 visible and invisible. He'll lead the armies of heaven on a white war horse. He will slay Goliath. He will crush the serpent's head. He will tread the grapes of wrath and avenge the blood of the innocent. He will inherit all the nations of the earth, ruling them with a rod of iron. Read Psalms 2. And he will receive their tribute and their gifts. The government will be upon his shoulders. When all opposition to his rule is abolished, then the promised rest, the shalom, 
will come. And I'm getting hot up here. Here we get a picture of what it is that fully satisfies the tra travail of Jesus' soul on the cross. That's an in-state vision worth living and dying for. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. When the apostles and early church preached the gospel, they preached forgiveness of sins in Jesus' name, but they also proclaimed a coming king, a coming kingdom, a resurrection of the dead, an appointed day of judgment by Messiah, and a throne in Jerusalem where Messiah would rule the nations with justice and bring shalom and rest to all creation. Whew. Now, back to our flyaway diagram. How do we continue to adjust the story? Well, adjustment number two, lose the angel wings. We don't become angels after we die. Hate to, hate to break the news to you. We retain our humanity. Angels and humans are two distinct classes of creation. Angels are spirit beings who sometimes can temporarily assume bodies, but they're in general disembodied spiritual beings. Humans, on the other hand, are a unity of spirit, soul, and body. It takes spirit, soul, and body to be fully human. Do you understand that? That's biblical anthropology. 101. Spirit, soul, and body. It takes all three to be what God calls human. As humans, we were created for embodiment, not to become disembodied angelic spirits. Embodiment is not optional. We should not desire disembodiment. 1 Thessalonians 5.23 says, Steve read that this morning in Sunday school. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you entirely. May your spirit, your soul, and your body be preserved complete without blame at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The confusion about becoming an angel after we die has come about due to one discussion Jesus had with some religious leaders called Sadducees who didn't believe in the resurrection of the body. In correcting their view of resurrection, Jesus said that in the resurrection there would not be marriage anymore, and in that respect, we'd be like the angels. He never said we'd be like the angels in all the other respects, such as wings and disembodied spirits. It's not really biblical to say of someone who has died that they got their wings, although it sounds sweet and pious. By the way, with regards to angel wings, did you know only cherubim and seraphim in the Bible have wings? That's only two classes of angels. Most of the other angels, there's no mention of any wings anywhere. So we need to get in our heads. We're humans now. We remain humans after we die. And humans need bodies, and thus humans need resurrection. So the third adjustment we need to make is resurrect the resurrection. Just so we're clear, we're talking about a physical body re resurrection, not a spiritual resurrection. The physical resurrection of believers is one of the most neglected and ignored doctrines in the church today. We need to find a way to recover it, to resurrect it from the pages of our Bible and give it the prominence and the emphasis it deserves. Tradition and the flyaway to heaven story have conditioned us to view death as immediate glorification with all the benefits. Who needs to wait for a body? Kind of seems redundant. Be honest with me. Kind of seems redundant, right? I believe that's a mistaken reading of Scripture. Jesus had to wait how long for resurrection? He had to wait three days for resurrection. And the Bible teaches we must wait also for our resurrection. We've got to make room for the resurrection in our story. So I've adjusted this diagram by adding resurrection to it, along with a huge fireworks symbol representing the explosive impact this event will have in the cosmos. I've also replaced the words, I'll fly away, with the words, I'll be awaiting resurrection in Christ. Now, I know this is a new way of thinking about death, but I believe it's, it's very biblical, and I want you just to, you know, think about it. Think about what I'm saying here. In the middle, between death and resurrection, I've added brackets representing what Bible scholars call the intermediate state or the interim state. We don't have time to explore in detail that this morning, and there's 
there's several different interpretations about it, to be honest. But I've selected three words that I believe accurately characterize this in-between state between death and resurrection, this temporary period, and it is a temporary period for the Christian. Those three words are blessed, restful, and waiting. Blessed, restful, and waiting. In the book of Revelations 14.3, look at these three verses. I heard a voice from heaven saying, Write, Blessed are the dead. For that slide forward. Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Thank you. Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, so that they may rest from their labors, for their deeds follow with them. Look at there. You find the words blessed and rest together when speaking of the dead in Christ. Revelation also gives us another picture of martyrs who were killed because of their testimony and they had not yet entered into the fullness of resurrection joy. Let's see what they were told when they cried out for justice against those who murdered them. When the lamb broke the fifth seal, I saw underneath the altar the souls of those who had been slain because of the word of God and because of the testimony which they had maintained. And they cried out with a loud voice saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, will you refrain from judging and avenging our blood on those who dwell on the earth? And there was given to each of them a white robe. And they were told that they should, look at it, rest for a little while longer until the number of their fellow servants and their brethren who were to be killed, even as they had been, would be completed also. So the dead martyrs were told to rest a little while longer, implying they'd previously been resting and waiting. So in these two passages, we see the dead in Christ blessed, resting, and waiting for resurrection. Stephen gives us a beautiful model of at our point of death, Jesus actually gave us the same pattern. What did Jesus do as he was dying? He said, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. Ecclesiastes says, the spirit returns to God who gave it. Stephen, when he was being stoned and martyred, what did Stephen do? He said, I see Jesus standing by the right hand of the Son of Man. And he cried out and he said, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. See, Jesus had asked the Father to receive his spirit. Now we get to pray, Jesus, at the point of death, receive our spirit. It's a beautiful picture. Blessed in Christ, waiting for resurrection. Romans 8. 11 through 25, Paul refers to resurrection by four different names. It's on the screen there. Let's look at them. Being glorified with Christ. Number two, revealing of the sons of God. Number three, our public adoption as sons. Number four, as the redemption of our bodies. The theological word for what happens to us at bodily resurrection is the word glorification. Will you say that with me? Glorification. By the way, all these slides will be made available on my theological blog called burningthrone.org, in case you're wondered. We'll make those available to you. Contrary to what the flyaway story implies, we are not glorified at the time of death. When are we glorified? At resurrection. That's our hope. Christ in us, the hope of glory in us. It's the hope of glorification. The Bible tells us that currently there's only one human being who has experienced resurrection and glorification never to die again. Who might that be? Jesus. That's why the Bible calls him in Colossians 1.18 and Revelation 1.5 the firstborn from the dead. More resurrected sons of God are coming. In 1 Corinthians 15, the great resurrection chapter in the Bible, Jesus is called the first fruit of a huge harvest to come of resurrected human sons and daughters. The whole creation is groaning and waiting expectantly for this astounding, cosmic-shaking event to happen. When Jesus glorifies us, publicly acknowledges us before all creation, angels and human, as adopted sons of God, and unveils us to the rest of the world in stunning glory and honor. It's like Superman 
superwoman. You got it underneath your shirt here at the resurrection. Guess what you get to do? This is what Jesus does for you. Ta-da! Okay? Glory. New bodies, resurrected bodies like his. When will the resurrection happen? Jesus says it will happen in the last day. John 6, 39 through 40, Jesus says, This is the will of him who sent me. I will lose nothing of all that he's given me. I will raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life. I will raise him up on the last day. The last day here refers to when Jesus returns in flaming fire with great power and glory. Paul teaches us in 1 Thessalonians 4, 16. You guys know this. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, with the sound of the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ, they'll rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. Please understand, resurrection is a group event. It's a team sport. We all get raised together at the last trumpet blast. Isn't that going to be just, it's like, foot, I'm not a big football fan, but it's like when you have a huge championship game and the bands are playing and they've got the, you know, cheerleaders got the, whatever it is, think the, I can't think of the word, it's the things that they run through. Banners, yeah, huge banner at the goalpost, right. And then the team comes running out, <laughs> you know, and they bust through onto the field. That's what, to me, that's a vision of what resurrection is going to be like. All of us raised from the dead, running towards Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now, we happen to be alive when Christ returns. We get to skip death completely, go straight to glorification. How cool is that? Would you like that? That's what in the Bible is called rapture by theologians. Immediate glorification without going through death. So, get it in your mind. Salvation is not just for our souls. It's also for our bodies. Jesus is mighty to save our entire being, spirit, soul, and body. Until we receive the redemption of our bodies, we will not have experienced the fullness and completion of the salvation that Jesus has purchased for us. We need to put that in our pipe and smoke it. All right, how can we change, practically speaking, when we speak about the death of a loved one to give more prominence and emphasis to the biblical truth of resurrection? Here's one way that I found helpful. When Charlie Daniels passed away, whom Jim actually knew, Jim and Trina, their family actually knew Charlie Daniels. When he passed away in July last year, I saw a tweet by Stephanie Quick, who happens to work on staff at Frontier Alliance International. You guys know who that is? FAI? It's the ministry that produced the movies Sheep Among Wolves. Volume 2. <laughs> and Volume 1. They did Volume 1 too. But for some reason... Bethany really likes volume two. <laughs> anyway, at the end of the tweet, Stephanie wrote, Rest till the resurrection, brother. I like that. I've adopted that phrase, and I've actually started using it recently. For many years, I've been sensing the Holy Spirit's been directing me to gain a, to gain a deeper understanding of resurrection. In 2012, I actually updated the instructions on my will to include an epitaph on my tombstone that reads, I will rise when he calls my name. Amen. I think Chris Tomlin has a song. I also put instructions in my will to have that song sung at my funeral. I will rise when he calls my name. It's just one of the ways I want to show the Lord that I believe in his words about resurrection on the last day. You may find it interesting, there's a Christian burial tradition where tombstones in the cemetery are oriented to face towards the east. Did you know that? Mm -hmm. That's in anticipation of Jesus splitting the eastern sky when he returns. And you want to rise from the, gr the grave facing him, don't you? 
That's right. All right, the fourth adjustment to our story. We're bringing this plane down now. Fourth adjustment to our story is to seek the city that comes down. Seek the city that comes down. New Jerusalem, not heaven, is the eternal home of the saved. It comes down from heaven to the earth. I believe a lot of us Christians are confused about the direction of salvation. It's a little bit like the five-year-old kid playing football. What's with all these football analogies? I'm not even a sports fan. Somehow they made their way into my notes. It's like a little five-year-old. You guys have probably experienced this, maybe with your, your kids. They're playing football, they catch the ball, and all of a sudden they run, but they're running in the wrong direction. Everybody's saying, no, no, the goal post is this way. Well, to me, that's an analogy. Sometimes I think we're confused about the direction of salvation. The direction of salvation, according to the Bible, is down, not up. Down, not up. Salvation in the Bible is from heaven to earth. Jesus told us to pray, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Heaven is the origin of the kingdom. Make no mistake. New Jerusalem is in the heavens. But the direction is to come down. Instead of focusing on going to heaven and saying, heaven, here I come, I believe we should be praying, Maranatha, Maranatha, our Lord, come. Come down, Lord. That was the cry of the early church. The last book of the Bible, we see New Jerusalem, the city of gold. Which direction is it headed? Up or down? It's coming down. We just see it descending down. Not only the New Jerusalem, we also see in the last book of the Bible, God coming down to dwell tabernacle among men. See, we're trying so hard to get up to heaven to be with God. God's trying so hard to get down to earth to be with us. Who's going to win? <laughs> the ultimate end state. God's going to win. He's coming down. He comes down to dwell with us permanently. He even relocates his throne here. He's trying hard to bring down heaven to earth and dwell among men in a heavenized earth. Can you think of that? A heavenized earth. The Bible tells us that the New Jerusalem is the permanent and eternal home of the saved. It's the city built without hands in the heavens but then comes down to us. I want to be where God, Jesus, and his capital city end up. How about you? It's true. The world system is not my home, but I'm not just passing through. I'm seeking the city that comes down, and that's my home, and that's your home too. The final adjustment we need to make to the story is don't abandon the earth. The reason is simple. God doesn't plan to abandon it. This is my father's world. He owns it. He has a title deed to it. He called it very good. He'll make it new again, just like he's making you and me new creations in Christ. He'll give the earth to the meek as their inheritance. I like what Randy Alcorn tweeted on this topic. God doesn't promise, promise us a non-earth. He promises us a new earth. Earth does not disappear in the new creation, leaving only heaven. No, earth stays in the picture for eternity. Air, land, mountains, brooks, rivers stay in the picture in new creation. Plants, vegetation, flowers, and trees stay in the picture. Birds and animals stay in the picture. The wolf will dwell with the lamb. Eating stays in the picture. Can somebody say hallelujah? hallelujah. Freshly baked bread, delicious fruit, even aged wine stays in the picture in the renewed earth. Jesus has claim to the entire earth and its nations as his rightful possession. He will enforce his claim and possess his possession. The earth will be purged by fire, renewed, transformed, but not annihilated. The curse will be removed. A cleansed earth will emerge from the fires. Eden will return. The tree of life will return. The leaves of that tree will be Bring perpetual health to the nations. The throne of God will relocate from heaven to earth. Heaven and earth will finally become one through what God has done in Christ, who is the fulfillment of Jacob's ladder connecting heaven and earth. Jesus will see the travail of his soul, and he will be satisfied. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Yes. yes. Chip and Joanna Gaines had a popular TV series called Fixer Upper. 
where they come in and they renovate old homes and transform them into something hardly recognizable. Well, that's what Christ is going to do in the future, only on a cosmic scale. How many know Christ is the master fixer-upper? Demolition comes first. To strip away the rot and the mold and the infestation of wickedness and evil that have ruined God's creation. Then comes renovation and restoration, making all things new again. The new creation will have some continuity with the old, but it's going to be such a new makeover that it will be hard to recognize the old. All creation is waiting in eager anticipation for that day. Whew, so there we have it. We've adjusted the flyaway story to bring it into alignment with what I believe is a more biblical vision of God's intent for humanity and the world. The vision's grand and majestic and so much more than just waiting to die and go to heaven. We've expanded the story by adding the creation bookends. We're going to believe in the regeneration. We're going to add back the king and the gospel of the kingdom. We're going to lose the angel wings. We're going to resurrect the resurrection. We're going to seek the city that comes down from heaven. And we're not going to abandon the earth. Where does that leave us this morning? Where does that leave you this morning? Are you wanting to fly away or rise from the dead in the last state to possess the land with Joshua Jesus? This morning is a time for adjustment and alignment. Time is short. It's time for all of us to wake up. Salvation is nearer to us than when we first believed. Are you a follower of Jesus, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world? If not, I appeal to you this day, repent of your sins and call upon him to save you. Today is the day of salvation for you. The good shepherd is seeking you, his lost sheep. Don't wait. Act now before you meet him as judge, before he appears as lion of the tribe of Judah to separate the wheat from the chaff and consume the chaff an unquenchable fire. If you know Jesus already this morning, what's the Holy Spirit, what adjustments are the Holy, is the Holy Spirit prompting you to make? Are you in alignment and agreement with God's end time vision? Are you seeking the coming kingdom as your top priority so that you won't be ashamed and shrink back when you see him coming in great power and glory with all of his holy angels? You're just waiting to die and go to heaven. Are you proving your allegiance to Messiah every day, learning to please him, hear his voice, and growing in your obedience? Has your love grown cold? Are you passively waiting for the by and by? Are you actively serving God by the power of the Holy Spirit, doing business for the master now, doing the good works he's appointed for you, so that when you die in the Lord, you can rest from your labor and your works will follow you? Works are the fruit of living faith. Will you have any good works to follow you? Are you willing to do whatever it takes to follow him as a disciple right now, even though that may mean suffering for his sake in this age, so that you can share with him in glory in the age to come? Will Jesus be able to trust you in the regeneration to sit alongside him when he sits on the throne of his glory in Jerusalem governing the nations? If you're in a difficult place this morning, will you run into the loving arms of God and confess that though the wrong seems so strong, God is your ruler yet. He will help you hold up under trial and difficulties. So do not throw away your confidence and hope in Him. The one who overcame will help you be an overcomer too. In closing, you were made for more than dying and going to heaven. Jesus is surrounding himself today with those whom he will place in positions of great responsibility and honor in the future. I want to thank you guys for paying close attention to me this morning. I'd like to end with another video clip from the land of Narnia. And when you see Peter, Susan, Edmund, and Lucy, I hope you will see your future self in this video.
the glistening eastern sea, I give you Queen Lucy, the Valiant. the great western wood, King Edmund, the just, to the radiant southern sun, Queen Susan, the gentle, and to the clear northern sky, I give you King Peter, the magnificent. Once a king or queen of Narnia, always a king or queen. May your wisdom grace us until the stars rain down from the heavens. Long live King Peter! Long live King Edward! Long live King Susan! Long live King Susan! Would you stand, please? All hail King Jesus. Would you bow your heads? Would you prayerfully consider making the adjustments and the alignment that the Holy Spirit's calling you to make this morning? Wherever you are, you can push in further. you need to repent, repent. God's waiting. Open arms. If you want to rule and reign with Jesus, you've got to take with it suffering and rejection and denial of self, all that stuff we don't like. You've got to take that part of it too. But trust me, anything we go through now is, will not be worthy of the glory that's coming for us in Jesus. As John David leads us in worship this morning, would you make whatever adjustment, whatever alignment God's asking you to make this morning?